So before we start the story, I want to give a little pretext about semiconductor production to everyone. So there are two major areas in semiconductor production. The first is semiconductor design and the second is semiconductor manufacturing. So, and these two departments usually work independent of each other. So let us take a quick example to understand this, the Android devices that we majorly use. So Android devices use a Snapdragon processor chip. Now uh, this Snapdragon processor chip, it's designed by Qualcomm. Qualcomm is a tech company which designs these uh, Snapdragon chips. And once the design is finalized, Qualcomm hands over the design to a semiconductor manufacturing company like TSMC, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. So then TSMC takes those designs and manufactures the actual semiconductor. And once the semiconductor is manufactured, TSMC hands over the final semiconductor product to the mobile device companies like OnePlus or Redmi. And these mobile device companies use those uh, uh, Snapdragon chips in their mobile devices and they roll out the mobile devices into the market, customers buy it, and the usual process follows. So the basic flow over here is first the semiconductor design company, then the semiconductor manufacturing company, and then the mobile device company. So like we have already covered the pretext here. So let's get back to our story. And for this, let us rewind to 2007. So what happened in 2007 is Apple launched its first iPhone. Now it was a revolutionary uh, mobile device. It was one of its kind, but it had some of its shortcomings. Like it had short battery life, it had slow internet, no front camera, and most importantly, it was not a powerful mobile device in itself. Like it could not accommodate a lot of the applications. So, and one of the main reasons why these shortcomings existed, it was because the components that were used inside the Apple mobile phone, they came from different sources. Like one of the component that was used inside, inside the first iPhone, it came from a DVD player uh, of Samsung. So you can imagine the kind of mismatch of components that happen inside the Apple iPhone. Now, uh, Steve Jobs, Apple's co-founder, he was aware of these uh, shortcomings and he was also aware of the reason why these shortcomings existed, about the mismatch. And Steve Jobs himself had a vision for the Apple company that he wanted the Apple products to be unique in the market. He wanted the Apple products to stand out amongst all its competitors. So he started brainstorming ideas like what they could do that could make their products unique or what they could do that could help the Apple to stand out amongst its competitors. And while they were brainstorming ideas, they somehow stumbled upon this idea, like what if Apple designed its own chips? Like what if Apple designed customized chips that were only specifically designed for Apple products? Now, this was a unconventional idea. It was totally, totally an out of a box idea and no other company even thought of doing so. And so in this part of the story, a very important person enters and his name is Mr. Johnny. So Mr. Johnny is a semiconductor engineer by profession. And back then he was working in some other firm. So Apple hired Mr. Johnny into their own company and Mr. Johnny was brought on board and Apple discussed this idea with him. So Mr. Johnny coming from a semiconductor background had a lot of knowledge and expertise in this field. And he understood the company's vision, like what the company was expecting and why they wanted to design their own chips and everything. So now when Mr. Johnny was understanding all these ideas and the vision of the company, he realized how risky and challenging it could be. Like designing a chip from scratch is a challenging process in itself. And usually what happens is when we use our mobile devices, we use Android operating system or iOS. So whenever there is a bug in the software system, the Android company sends us a software update. We download that software update and whatever the bug existed, it gets fixed and a device starts running smoothly. But in the case of hardware, fixing a bug or fixing a like component of the chip, it's not that easy. And Mr. Johnny realized this part, that even if a tiny part of the chip uh, fails, the entire device could be compromised. So he understood the challenges of this project, but at the same time, Mr. Johnny understood that if somehow they are able to crack this down, if somehow they're able to do this, they'll be able to change the market forever. Like this could be a game changer for them. So over the next few years, Mr. Johnny got back to work and he started working on this unconventional idea for designing uh, customized chips for Apple products. And finally came the year 2013. 
So in 2013, Apple released their A7 chips. Now, A7 chips were the first smartphone chips with 64-bit architecture. What it means is that it was a desktop class architecture in a super slim phone. And you can understand, you can imagine that this made the iPhone significantly faster and this enabled iPhone to accommodate all kinds of uh, features and functionalities in it. And this innovation was so impactful, like iPhone was able to do those things which other phone devices could not even think of. And so this innovation made all the other mobile device companies to rethink their strategy just to keep up with Apple because Apple was growing so fast because of this innovation. And so this unconventional decision to design their own chips truly transformed the mobile device industry for Apple. And Mr. Johnny was the person who made this all into a reality. Now, the reason why we have chosen this particular story to share with you all today is because we wanted to highlight two things. First is the power of knowledge and second is the impact of unconventional choices. Now, Mr. Johnny's expertise in semiconductors allowed an entire company, the Apple company, to revolutionize an entire market, the smartphone market. But also, it was not just his knowledge, it was also his willingness to work on an unconventional idea. He welcomed that unconventional idea and out of the box idea with welcoming arms and he worked on it. He believed in it, even though it was not a common practice at that time. And I think at this point, I should mention that at present, Mr. Johnny is the senior vice president of Apple's hardware technologies. And since we're talking about Apple, I think it's worth noting that Apple's CEO, Mr. Tim Cook, is an industrial engineer himself. And Mr. Tim Cook's knowledge and expertise has helped Apple to grow its uh, company's market value significantly. And I think that's a story for another time. So let's not get into it right now. So coming back to our original story about Mr. Johnny and the customized chips and the Apple company, what do we learn from it? Sometimes in life, we have to take decisions that may be unconventional, that may be out of the box and nobody else is doing it. But we have to realize that those are the only decisions that will set us apart in this competitive world. And this brings us to us to our conclusion over here that a career in semiconductors like Mr. Johnny has or a career in industrial engineering like Mr. Tim Cook has, these career fields hold immense potential, not just to transform your own future, but entire humanity and entire global population. So, and Taiwan can offer you just the right environment to make this all a reality. Now, especially when the trend for like most of the Indian students is to choose a Western country for their higher studies, take the courage to make an unconventional choice of choosing Taiwan and see for yourself how that transforms your life, how that transforms your career. And as we begin today's webinar, let's remember that each one of us has the potential to make a big impact on this world. Like, Mr. Johnny did, like Mr. Tim Cook is doing. And as we proceed further with this webinar, we should realize that we each hold the power to shape our own future and achieve extraordinary things. And Taiwan, with its high quality education and a welcoming job market for international students, Taiwan is just the perfect place to make these possibilities a reality. So that is all for my opening today. Thank you everyone for listening. And on this note, let us begin our webinar. Okay, so today we have, thank you so much, yeah, yes, very good job, um, um, Ash. So today, uh, without further delay, actually, um, let's uh, start our, um, today our, um, one, one of the most, I mean, um, the first um, university in Taiwan have bilingual um, um, program, and they are the one who is always accept the new thing. They actually, and when I started up, I'm, uh, by the way, I'm the CEO of uh, and the founder of Educare Taiwan. When I started my Educare Taiwan, um, YZU is the one of the first, um, there are two universities, one is NSYZU and the other one is the YZU accepted me and started working with me. So I deeply appreciate, I mean, I mean their open-minded attitude always actually. So today um, we have the first presenter is the, uh, the head of uh, international office, Professor Liang. Okay, hello everyone. 
My name is Yunjia Liang. Um, on behalf of the Yunzi University, I would like to give a brief introduction about uh, our university. And also one of my uh, colleague, uh, Lucas, will introduce about the application procedure and also the scholarship. Okay, so um, as you may know that the uh, Yunzi University is one of the best uh, private university in, in Taiwan. We were established by the Far Eastern Group and this is considered as one of the, uh, we will say the great uh, commercial group in Taiwan. And our university uh, was established in 1989 as the Yuanzi Institute of Technology. So we actually start with the five engineering department, such as the electrical engineering, computer science and engineering, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, and industrial engineering. But after all these years, and uh, the 35 years, we actually have uh, extended the UNC University as the like, uh, university on the um, five plus one college. Later on, I will share with you what I'm calling is still the five plus one college and with lots of different major now, uh, including the engineering, management, and also the linguistic and et cetera. Okay, but I know that the background of the attending uh, today, most of you actually have the background in engineering, like such as the electrical engineering, computer science engineering, etc. So I will focus more on the introduction about those related department. So this is the Far Eastern uh, group. So we can see that they have the uh, lots of the different industry. For example, they have the manufacturing one, the polyester, and also we have a medical center, we have the transportation logistic company and wholesale like a department store, et cetera. Okay, so that means our students have lots of chance to work on those like a different industry and to join the industry after the graduate. But of course, uh, uh, Yunzi University is located in the Northern part of Taiwan. In just in the Taoyuan city itself, we have uh, more than 20 industrial park in this area. So if you want to stay in Taiwan after you graduate, there are lots of job opportunity here. Okay. And currently we have around uh, 8,500 uh, to 8,700 uh, uh, degree student. Uh, close to 10% of the student are the international student. We are very proud that we have uh, over 50 other international students from the 50 different countries. So it's a very diversified internationalized uh, environment campus. So uh, you will feel safe and also friendly environment over here. Okay, we also have uh, some international faculty member on campus as well in all the majors. So you, you do have the chance. We, we do have some uh, faculty uh, member uh, in electrical engineering and also from India as well. So some high uh, reputation that you can see from the Times or the QS, we are considered actually the uh, one of the best uh, private university in Taiwan. And we are very strong in lots of areas such as the computer science, engineering, business economics, etc. Okay. And also we have lots of partner university all over the world. So for our students, they also have a very good chance to maybe as the uh, acting as the exchange student or doing some internship overseas as well. Okay, so um, now I'm going to start to introduce about the, the first college, the College of Engineering. As I mentioned, the very first five engineering department uh, when we established the Yuanzi Institute of Technology. You can see right over here, we have the mechanical, chemical engineering, and material science, industrial engineering, and management right over here. All of them have from the bachelor and master all the way to the PhD degree. And also some key area you might be interested in. For example, over here, we have the smart manufacturing. And also we have a very strong the biotechnology. And also we have the nano technology and also including something related to the, we will say the medical application from the me uh, mechanical engineering professor as well. And another thing I would like to introduce about the second college, College of Informatics. Over here, we have the computer science and engineering, information management, information communication, 
etc. So over here, you can see the key developer area we, we have is such as the big data, one of the very hot uh, research area. We also have the IoT and intelligent living. But one thing, please keep uh, one thing in mind. At YZU, I will say that for the big data analytics, for the uh, IoT, or even for the artificial intelligence, well, I can uh, say that very proudly that almost all the college in uh, at YZU, uh, we have a professor in different domain. They actually try to apply the knowledge in the big data analytics in the IoT or the AI, okay? So not just limited to the electrical engineering or computer science or like industrial engineering, even the professor from the College of Management, uh, they are doing some research related to the, the those area. And also in the College of Informatics, they also have a very strong the biomedical informatics as well, okay? So just like uh, let you know something quite interesting over here. The next one is the electrical and communication engineering. Over here, we have uh, uh, electrical engineering in three different ma major, electrical engineering, communication engineering, and photonics engineering. And actually in the Far Eastern group, uh, we the company owned the second largest uh, telecommunication company in Taiwan. So actually we have very strong communication engineering area as well. So you can see once again, uh, IOT application, artificial intelligence application, and also the intelligent biomedical, okay? So those are very strong. And also, of course, the semiconduct industry. Uh, in the electrical and communication engineering, they have very strong uh, area in this part. For example, uh, one of our um, partner university in India, Sastra University, they actually already sent uh, this year has been the third year they have sent a master's student uh, to the electrical and communication engineering college to learn the knowledge about the uh, semiconduct. And after that, they return to India and find a very good job in Tata. So that's one of the very uh, good potential for, for you guys as well. Okay. And we also have very strong the college of management and uh, even though I know most of you have the engineering background, but we, uh, I would still like a brief introduce about the College of Management. We have the business administration, we have the marketing, accounting, finance, the fintech, etc. So those are also quite strong uh, area for us as well. Okay. And the final one, I think I will just briefly mention, we have the two linguistic department and R and design, etc. Okay. And the final thing, we do have uh, the five plus one, the new uh, college to be will be the uh, medical, the college of the medicine. So we already have a master's degree. And also we are uh, already, we start to have a uh, department of the nursing starting from this fall. Okay, so this is another thing re highly related to the uh, medical. After this, I would like to also introduce some research centers. So let you know, uh, because those research center were joined by the faculty member from the different college, okay? So for example, we do have a big data um, research center. We have a very strong green technology research center, the environmental technology research center, also the smart production and innovation uh, management, communication research, Jaron technology for the elders, and also we have artificial intelligence application. The last one is re related to the College of Management Entrepreneurship. Okay, so some very brief uh, introduction about the uh, like a big data. Big data center actually also get a sponsor, a very big uh, company, the ZDT. They actually uh, contribute uh, three, uh, 30 million NT dollars to this research center, doing lots of research about the big data analytics. Okay, so this is quite interesting. So lots of professor from College of Informatics, College of the, uh, Electrical Engineering, and also College of uh, Engineering join this research center. 
The next one is the communication engineering uh, research center. So as we can, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, in the Far Eastern group, we have a telecommunication company. So this research center has lots of equipment actually donated by the, the telecommunication company. They are doing like a 5G and lots of like a advanced technology in this area as well. And the next one will be the green technology related to more like envir environmental uh, engineering and also the chemical engineering part. So this is also a very important one. And this one, actually, they also recently, they tried to do lots of research about the fuel cell and also the, uh, we will say the hydrogen, uh, very advanced, like a new, uh, we will say the uh, technology for the cell. And the next one, the Jerome technology, this one already spin out a, a company to serve the, the technology for the elders. Okay, and environmental technology, then the last one, the artificial intelligent uh, application. In this area, they actually apply the AI technology in lots of them related to the, I will say the medical application. They also recently, the faculty member over here won lots of uh, award from some competition as well. Okay, I know those are very, um, it's a very brief introduction, but those are very interesting and important uh, research center at YCU currently, okay? And last one will be the smart manufacturing. Uh, I think due to the time limit, I will quickly wrap up over here, okay? And so this one, I just wanna introduce like about, we do have some career information from the Far Eastern. Our students have the chance to join like a summer internship or even become the, uh, uh, the employee after you graduate. Okay, we do have those uh, uh, career uh, opportunity for our student. And also some internship you probably heard before, the TEP or the IIPP. So we welcome the student to apply those. Those actually the funding are sponsored by the Taiwan government, Ministry of Education or the National Science and uh, Technology Council. Okay. And I think those are very, um, some just like environment that I would like to introduce. That's some environment in, in on campus. So uh, if you join us, you will have the chance to use all the facility over here and also join the very interesting event. For example, in the middle one, you can see that's the Holy Festival. We actually host the uh, Holy Festival for the past few years for particularly a welcome all the uh, international and local students to join us. So that's the fun time for all the students over here, Christmas party and international food festival, etc. Okay. So I think that will be uh, the end of my presentation. The next uh, look as well, uh, introduce more about the scholarship and also the application process. And I hope we, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, ask us. And once again, thanks for coming to our webinar. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Liang. Just for everybody's information, um, there's a, um, the one Indian student who studied in Professor Liang's uh, lab, and he got the, a job offer of, uh, from Pentagon, and it's about um, 25 lakh rupees. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, two of them. <laughs> yes, they yeah. mm -hmm. all that job, actually. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Professor Alex, yeah, the stage is yours. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Yes, so we uh, can see it, yes. Okay, uh, this is Alex Wei from uh, uh, in uh, the campus of uh, YZU. We call it Academia, uh, Industry Ac uh, Academy. Uh, you know, people may feel strange. What is the Industry Academy? at uh, YZU campus. In fact, we were founded uh, back in uh, 2022. Uh, we, uh, our major task is to bridge the academia and industry. So uh, our mission statement is, uh, first of all, we uh, uh, tailor met talent, uh, talent cultivation for the industry. And also we maximize the value of academic technology developed by the campus of YZU. And uh, we also help commercializing the new technology invented by, uh, uh, by the faculties. And also, 
uh, will accelerate the industry transformation and upgrading in Taiwan. And a very strange term, we are the sales and marketing team for YZU. <laughs> okay. uh, there's a briefly about me, as you can see, uh, I spent all my life uh, in the industry, especially in uh, power electronics, semiconductor. And, uh, and I'm not going to go into uh, details about my uh, uh, career, but uh, this is just a briefly for your reference. Uh, talking about my uh, industry academy, uh, we currently have uh, seven uh, academies, uh, inc which includes uh, TSMC, Coltronics, Firestone New Era, Firestone, Adentech, Merles. Uh, as you can see details uh, on the right-hand side, uh, TSMC, we, in fact, we're conducting uh, wafer fab manufacturing engineering, uh, which includes uh, uh, smart manufacturing, device integration, facility management, instrumentation, etc. And uh, Coltronics, uh, we open two courses for them: management and optronics. Uh, you guys may be uh, using uh, the uh, uh, the projector, which includes the the technology of a DLP, uh, digital light processing. Uh, this is manufactured exclusively from Coltronics. And uh, Far Eastern uh, New Era, this is a company. Uh, in fact, this is our parent company. Uh, we are current, currently uh, focusing on digitization and smart ma manufacturing courses for them. And Far Eastern, this is uh, the course which uh, Brian, uh, Professor Liang has just mentioned. Uh, we are the number two biggest telecommunications so service provider company here in Taiwan. Uh, Adentech, this is a semiconductor testing company. And uh, most recently, we have another new partner, Merle. Merle is a number one automation company and, uh, in, uh, and also in a smart logistic. Uh, in our courses, we have a pulsary uh, courses, which is artificial intelligence, ESG, innovation, uh, creativeness, and entrepreneurship. Uh, since uh, we are more focused on a uh, uh, semiconductor program, uh, just uh, uh, we are just trying to elaborate uh, more about uh, what we are doing for TSMC. Uh, in fact, we open uh, uh, five categories for TSMC uh, courses. First of all, smart manufacturing. Uh, people are talking about uh, Industry 4.0. In fact, TSMC started uh, smart manufacturing back in most almost. 35, 40 years ago. And uh, I would say most of Taiwanese semiconductor companies, TSMC, uh, UMC, all those companies, we started simultaneously back in uh, decades. And also uh, TSMC will help them to conduct uh, advanced circuit design and uh, device integration, processing uh, technologies and uh, instrumentation. So. Uh, other than uh, the lectural, uh, lectural uh, courses, we also uh, do on-site education, which brings the academia to practical. Uh, now this just uh, uh, share with you about uh, what is semiconductor uh, industry process, starting from the wafer on the very left, then all the way down, oxidation, uh, aging, all the way down. I'm not going to go into very details for you, but just give you a very brief idea, which says this is a very complicated uh, combination of uh, material science, uh, all kinds of uh, technologies, uh, photography, uh, photolith. It's a very complicated uh, process, all uh, included, but we were able to, uh, to conduct all these programs inside of a uh, YZU. And uh, finally, and uh, further to, uh, to YZU, Taiwan was able to integrate all those technologies to be the world number one. Uh, coming back to the uh, double E uh, uh, program inside of the YZU campus, uh, we have uh, in fact three programs uh, for uh, double E courses. Uh, Program one uh, or program A, uh, we cover mostly artificial intelligence, uh, computer vision, cloud computing, next gen of uh, networking, and uh, control engineering. Uh, we have uh, uh, electromechanical integration. 
uh, intelligent systems, automation systems, robotic, and etc. And uh, regarding uh, uh, designs, you, as you know, uh, for integrated circuit semiconductor, we start the industry from design. So we have mixed signal design. Uh, people may ask, what is a mixed signal? Uh, in fact, uh, signal, uh, uh, we have a, a digital signal, we have also a, a logical, uh, logical signal. If we combine those signals together, in fact, uh, the, in the extreme application, uh, we have to combine those signals. So we have a mixed signal uh, uh, IC design and uh, multi-signals uh, multi applications as well. Uh, for cost B, uh, program B, uh, we are more, more focused on uh, telecoms. Uh, as you made uh, aware of uh, the new technology, uh, which is a uh, orbital satellite. Uh, we are having uh, this uh, most advanced technology inside of our, uh, uh, our lab. So, uh, and also uh, our working frequency can be as high as 120 gigahertz, which is a very uh, outstanding uh, achievement already. And uh, now talking about artificial intelligence, we are one of the best uh, uh, in Taiwan. Uh, the third one, uh, or program C, is uh, more focused on uh, uh, optronics, semiconductor, green energy. Uh, uh, again, uh, on this program, we help uh, the uh, uh, what's so called Coltronics. This is a company, uh, in fact, this company, through our help, they launched the first Pico projector, which is, uh, you know, the, the projector size is about the same size as your handset mobile, mobile phone. So this was, was launched back in almost 10 years back. And right now we are doing uh, all kind of uh, uh, optronics uh, projectors with a nano, nano uh, optronics uh, technologies, organic lighting, OLED, uh, gallium nitride. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this term, gallium nitride or uh, silicon carbide. This is so what's so called uh, uh, three valued semiconductor. This is a new technology, and we are ahead of all these uh, uh, technologies. Uh, above, uh, briefly, what uh, I would like to share with you tonight, and uh, I wish to meet you guys at my campus very soon. I thank you very much. If you have any question, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Alex. Thank God. This is exactly what you guys just study, semiconductor. Yes. We are waiting. We are waiting for the for the for the guys from India. Uh, all the students actually, I mean, there are few um, very important, um, I mean, uh, profession coming. Of course, everybody know AI, but AI 90% 90 90 of the students know AI, but very few people really know that semiconductor actually is more would be more needed um, in India than not in than AI, but because comparatively, actually, less people know semiconductor more people know AI. So actually, you will have the better chance to win in the competition when you have this. Um... Good day, everyone. I'm Dr. Yogi Prasatiro from UMC University. And today I'm going to share uh, my research about applied co cognitive and macroergonomics in sustainable development for disaster management. This is the agenda of my presentation. Uh, I will start from introduction. And I will start about what is human factors and ergonomics. Then I'm going to share my research in cognitive ergonomics and macroergonomics in sustainable development for disaster management. So uh, here is actually my profile, everyone. So um, I'm currently an assistant professor in international bachelor program in engineering, but I'm, uh, but I'm also a jointly appointed uh, assistant professor at the Department of Industrial Engineering and Management at UNC University. And my research interests mostly actually about human factors and ergonomics and all the things about human factors and ergonomics, but at the same time, I'm widening my horizons by doing um, data mining and data heuristics for the methodology. Okay, and then um, 
So let's start with this one first. What is human factors and ergonomics? Basically, everyone, uh, human factors and ergonomics is actually a scientific discipline that concerns about the human and the interactions uh, between this human and the other elements. And the goal basically just to optimize human well-being and overall system performance. And human factors in ergonomics, basically we can split it into three big domains. And the first one is physical ergonomics. We talk about human anatomy and physiology, postural analysis, and so on and so forth. And then we talk about cognitive ergonomics. We talk about the visual display. We talk about human computer interaction, usability. Basically, we talk about this one. And the last one, we talk about macro ergonomics, basically between human and the social technical system. And we talk about the uh, human behavior. We talk about job design, accommodation, customer behavior, and so on. So um, as you can see, uh, these are actually like uh, <clears throat> some natural disasters that actually we are facing, you know, in Taiwan, we have an earthquake uh, and this year, you know, we got hit by the 7.4 uh, scale of the earthquake. It was pretty big, okay? And then uh, because Taiwan is actually located in the ring of fire, okay? And then like the, the typhoon and after the typhoon, usually we have flood and also landslide. So it's actually quite devastating, okay? Um, and then... Um, Okay, this one is actually like the one eruption that actually happened in Indonesia. Like the, this is actually a like volcanic eruption. It was all of a sudden then, um, I think more around 50 or something people died, okay? Uh, not just because of the hot air, but also because of the flash flood, also because of the uh, eruption. And uh, as you might know, or perhaps like uh, some of you experienced this one, or like you are like one of the survivors of the, uh, you know, big, um, great, uh, how you call it, the tsunami disaster in 2004, um, that happened 20 years ago. So it hit uh, Indonesia, and then, then more than 200,000 people dead in Indonesia. But I think you know, uh, the causalities actually reached to India. Myanmar, Thailand, Sri Lanka, and up to Madagascar. So uh, today, everyone, I'm going to uh, share uh, regarding the uh, SDG. Uh, I'm going to share about uh, these three uh, main uh, big domains. Those are good well and well-being, affordable and clean energy, and the last one, actually, climate action. So basically, my research in these three domains. So, uh, when we talk about the, any kind of the natural disasters, everyone, I know like uh, most of you are actually experiencing, you know, like perhaps you experience earthquake or perhaps you experience fire or you experience what volcanic eruption and so on. And then uh, basically, you know, the way I try to analyze those, actually we can break down into this uh, mind map. So uh, we can talk about fire, volcanic eruption, flood disaster, typhoon, tsunami, and so on. And then the framework, basically, I use the some uh, human theory, like I would like to say um, social psychology theory, and those are theory of planned behavior, protection motivation theory, and also uh, we can talk about the system usability scale if you would like to add about cognitive ergonomics. And the data analysis, you know, we can do some uh, you know some methods for example structural equation modeling and or we can combine with the random forest classifier or artificial neural network and so on and the data basically uh, most of my studies actually i collected the data through the questionnaire okay so it can be uh purposive sampling can be convenient sampling can be snowball sampling and so on and we try to see what's actually happening uh, and what we can do uh, when while well facing about those natural disasters. And basically everyone, natural disaster, uh, there is a cycle of the natural disaster. And this is the cycle. So whether you like it or not, it will come again and again. Okay, so it starts with the preparation, you prepare it, then it's actually, you know, it happened. Then you do the response of the those the natural disasters then you recover, and after you recover, you try to mitigate, and after you mitigate, then you're ready again, you know, for the next upcoming uh, natural disaster. For example, like the earthquake, okay? We prepare that there will be an earthquake that actually, you know, uh, it happens. 
then we do the response, we do recover, we try to mitigate, and then we prepare again, and it will, you know, happen again, again, and so on. So uh, this actually some of the publication that I've done. Uh, basically, before everyone, I had uh, three years and nine months experience, uh, working experience in the Philippines. So uh, uh, most of my studies actually like the, in, uh, you know, in the Philippines, but now uh, I've been working in UNC University for like uh, one year, one and a half, more than one and a half years. So my publication actually starts shifting from the Philippines to Taiwan. So uh, let's talk about this one. Uh, the third agenda is actually cognitive ergonomics. So everything actually above the neck, you know, like the uh, your eye behaviors, you know, like your brain wave, you know, uh, those are actually about the cognitive ergonomics. And I have done one study, everyone. So this one actually about the visual display about the icon. So as you can see, you know, like this is from the WHO and during the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, you always can see the icon and icon is actually quite um, important for conveying the message when you do not understand the language. Okay. Um, so, uh, for example, like this one, see, this is from WHO and, you know, uh, everything in here, you can actually see uh, some icons there. So I tried to uh, do conduct a study, you know, with the 133 existing icons, actually uh, from 19 functions, for example, wash hand, wearing mask, social distance, and so on. Okay. And then each, actually, I collected seven and I tried to uh, rank from one to seven. And then after that, like, I would like to try to give some suggestion, okay, some suggestions to the, um, uh, the designers. So this is actually like the experiment. So everything was conducted online, everyone. So this one, I collected seven from uh, trusted resources like WHO, the uh, Ministry of the Health, and so on and so forth, okay. So this one, like the seven selected the... Uh, icons for one function for example watch hand and i try to ask the participant to rank number one to number seven which one that you like the most number one and number seven which one you dislike the most and then after that for example this one that you like the most number one then i you know conducted um, what we call is can say engineering or feeling engineering I would like to know why this icon is actually uh, more preferred or like uh, you know why this one is actually better than uh, the rest using like one to five uh, uh, Likert scale in here, semantic differential scales, okay? Then these are some of the results, everyone. For example, the wash hand uh, from 57 participants. This one is the, the best one, and this one is the worst one. For example, you know, this one, talk about the consult doctor or seek medical help. You know, this is quite nice, right? There is a phone, there is a signal, and there's a doctor there. But here, look at that. This is like a mobile phone promotion or what? And then this is like the sushi chef, right? You know, those two icons, you know, are not conveying or like did not really convey, you know, the intended meaning. Because when you see this one, it's like this is not good for this function, okay? And for example, you know, avoid touching face like this is very nice right uh, there is one person there is like a cross with a red like this one it's pretty nice but look at this one this is perhaps like a, what tarot card or so on so that's why you know like people most people you did not like this one okay so the key findings in here is like the in my study like the image presented in the icon is the key point you know that affects the icon perceived quality so uh you need to make it like as close as possible to the uh the the real one and then like the there are of course you know this study is actually limited to like the those selected icons uh, but you know the next study perhaps you can conduct with the uh, the feature of the icon itself and look at this one, okay? For example, everyone, this is actually like there. It's written in the Tagalog, okay? Uh, this one is actually an icon of the volcanic eruption, okay? Of the volcanic, uh, how you call that? Um, active volcano, okay? And this is actually quite interesting, you know? Like there are some icons in here for the next research direction. And even here, tsunami warnings, there are some uh, choices that perhaps you might you might choose, you know? For example, like uh, this one, perhaps not really good because it looks like uh, you are in 
Maldives or you're in Hawaii, you know, like, uh, but I like this one because like it's really, oh, perhaps shred is better, you know, like the, and then with the uh, written words like this one, tsunami hazard. So I think this one is actually pretty good. So basically there are many studies that we can do with the icon, even with the, the f uh, further study, you, know, you can try to use the image processing, you know, to really uh, define what is actually a really good icon if you use the image processing, yeah. And this one, okay, uh, I've done another study using the, in Thailand, okay, uh, using Thai China. Okay, now, I um, mean, last but not the least, that the student already asked how to apply. Uh, now, um, the Lucas, uh, uh, Lucas from uh, uh, International Office is going to share with you how, I mean, um, uh, what's the application process. Okay, uh, Lucas, um, that the stage is yours. Yes. Yes. Okay, Lucas. so hi, I'm Lucas from Global Air Office Students University. I'm going to show you a video on how to apply. And before that, I would like to let you know that the next session for applying will be for the spring intake that will start from September 1st to October 15th. Application is from when? Can you from September 1st to October 15th. That's for the spring intake 2025. Okay. Okay, so right now I'll show you the video and later I'll tell you about the scholarship. Hello everyone, today I'm going to tell you how to apply for admission to Yen's University. This is the application website of Yen's University. The first step will be creating an account. To do that, please click the up right button here, sign in slash register. I already have an account, so I'll skip this part. The next step will be creating an application, which I already done. And here's the application that is almost ready to be submitted. Let's have a look. Okay, here you can choose programs that you would like to apply to. You can choose up to three different programs. So what happens if we submit here? Okay, the system will tell you there are some missing part in your application. Let's have a look. Okay, so if you're admitted, the admission letter will be sending to the address lived on the system. So make sure you have everything correct. Okay, when you switch from different page, the system will automatically save your application. So don't worry if you haven't saved before you close it. Okay, so you can write multiple motivation letters depending on the programs you apply to. In this case, for example, I have applied for the Master Program in Computer Science and Engineering and Global Master of Science. So, therefore, I have to write two different motivation letters. And here, please make sure you click Yes for applying YCU scholarship. And here, you need to write down where you know about our school. I will just say online is not here. Okay, so things like I need to write more about the motivation letter. Okay. Okay, now the application is complete, but there are some documents you need to upload it. So this must be finished before you submit it. Every single one must be clear. For this English provision C, if you are from an English spoken country, you can just select a native speaker. Then the system will automatically save your progress here, so don't worry about it. Please upload your passport and your bio page. Here, I already upload a random document. Please don't do that when you apply. Your previous degree. The transcript, autobiography or resume, you don't really need to upload the supporting document interview if you don't know what to upload. For the international status, please download from here and sign your name and upload it. 
Finally, financial statements. Please make sure you have a, a financial statement of more than four thousand dollars, four thousand U.S. dollar. Okay, so right now the application is ready to be submitted. Okay, as you can see here, the application is successfully submitted. So right now your application has been submitted, but please. Check your email box or the system messenger here frequently, or we might have we might ask you to submit some other documents or resubmit the documents. Okay, that's the end of the video. So I would like to tell you about the scholarship. Okay, so there are two kinds of scholarship in the university. We provide tuition fee and miscellaneous reimbursement and stipend. Or just like you see on the video, it's very easy to apply scholarship. You just need to click it when you apply. And for your for your information, almost like 80% of international students will be awarded with some, some part of the tuition fee reimbursement, but only a few will be awarded with the stipend, monthly stipend. And uh, for those who are interested in studying Taiwan, maybe in the whole semester, I will suggest, I will also suggest you to have a look on our website of our Taiwan government, which is a Taiwan scholarship. So I'll share with you a website of them. Uh, you can share with them later in the, oh, okay, after your sure. presentation. Yes. Huh. Okay. So basically there's only for four intakes, we, our government provides Taiwan scholarship. The Taiwan scholarship, the, to be more specifically, is the MOE, Ministry of Education, Taiwan scholarship that will pay for your tuition fee and maintenance fee, and besides that, provide you a monthly stipend. So they will announce their application from like in January or February in, on their website. So if you want to have a look, if you're interested, in, don't forget to have a look. Mm. Yes, I mean the MOE scholarship. Actually, they give the uh, tuition waiver, and then I mean they give you the tuition support, and then actually they give you about um, uh, twenty five thousand NT. So it's about um, how much? Uh, six thousand five hundred sixty five thousand rupees a month um, stipend yeah, for good. for master degree student for two years. For a PhD student, they give four years. So that's a lot of money. So basically, yeah. you can study almost for free um, um, in Taiwan, yes. Thank you. Okay, today, thank you so much. I mean, Professor Liam, Professor Alex and Lucas and Nyleen, thank you so much for, for this session and thank you for your time and um, everybody, bye-bye. <laughs>